On Radio 4 Longwave now, Edge FM, the last in the present series of Devout Skeptics, in which Belle Mooney and her guests explore the world between belief and unbelief. This week, Belle Mooney talks to John Cleese. possible to construct any definition of your attitude to religion? I don't think I could call it a definition, but I suppose what I feel is that there is a spiritual force in the universe, but that 95% of the time in modern society we're not in any correct mental state to tap into it. In other words, there's something going on, but it's a little bit like having a lot of radio waves in the atmosphere and not having a receiver. But is this something that you're aware of in yourself in that you can't tap in either, or are you trying no, to? No, that's right. I can't tap in either, but I'm trying to because I'm pretty sure that people who have tapped in weren't lying when they told me that they had. And I've read enough stuff about mysticism, not a huge amount, but enough to be rather startled that so many descriptions of it coming from so many different parts of the world in different centuries are so similar. So I think there's something going on. And this interest, which I know has been growing in you, mm. uh, is, it, is it a kind of hankering then? I mean, the, the, what you've yes. read, all the things you've read, which I know you want to talk about, um, th th there's something out there that you would actually like that you can't have. Oh, yes. I think that this offers a sense of meaning that I don't personally feel that I can get from anything else. I mean, on good days, you know? On good days when the sun's out and I'm feeling great, those days you don't really need a sense of meaning. Other days, well, you know, when things are going, so well, maybe you need it more. So maybe it's a sort of depressive syndrome to need this meaning. But I don't think so. I think it's more than that. I think if one could tap into these spiritual forces, and maybe find the very few people in the world now who really do know about some of this stuff. And I've been fortunate enough to meet two, I would say. And I, I, I feel this is worth spending quite a lot of time on. Of course, we, we don't do it because we get swept along by the everyday flux of life, you know, reading the newspapers as though they were ultimately important. And then not having time at the end of the day to read something worthwhile or meditate. I do that all the time. I mean, I've failed to meditate as many days as I meditate. It's very hard in the modern world, but um, I, uh, I intend to spend more time on it as I reach my dotage. Well, the language you're using about spiritual forces and meditation, of course, isn't the kind of language which most of us associate with religion in this culture, because no, you're, you're, we're using a different sort of terminology. So just to sort of to take you back to, to where all this begins, to your own childhood, uh, when you were a little boy, did you have an image of God? No, I don't think so. I, my, my problem has been, a lot of my life I've looked very carefully at what was going on around me without quite understanding what was going on. And I think if somebody had said to me, do you believe in God, I would have said yes, because I felt one ought to. Um, certainly in Western Supermare, let's say in the 40s. Uh, and if somebody then said, but what do you mean by it, I wouldn't have sort of, I would have asked someone else what the right answer is. It was that kind of thing. I was just f following the herd. The normal school RS lessons? And yes, that's right. Eric Idle wrote a wonderful uh, sketch once in Python, which I don't think we ever did, but it was, it consisted of a boy reading out his essay, you know, in which he proved that God could not be all good, because otherwise how could there be evil in the universe since God created the universe, to which the religious uh, master simply said, get out. <laughs> um, we weren't taught religion, and I resent this actually strongly. I resent quite a lot about my school career. We were not taught religion in what I consider to be an interesting form. It would have just been the Bible and Bible stories. It was Bible stories. It was who danced lightly and who re rode furiously in a chariot, that kind of rubbish. And then, of course, the Gospels, which were more or less incomprehensible to me. There was something about the Gospels when they were read out. Something in me took them in. Something in me recognized that this was something of a different order. But of course, when you hear, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand is doing, it stayed with me. 
But nobody made the slightest attempt to explain what it meant. And not at home either? Did, was it not part of no, your No, I don't think so. My parents were not very religious. They went occasionally to church. Dad said, you know, well, I'm, you know my church is, 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 is my home or something like that. Now, uh, the odd thing was, my first shrink asked me a lot about was my family religious. And so I thought about it a great deal in retrospect. And the truth was, we had all those social Protestant qualities like punctuality, cleanliness, tidiness, thrift, all kinds of self-denial. You know, turn the radio down, don't upset the neighbors. A tremendous taboo against any kind of boasting or blowing your own trumpet, um, not being flamboyant, you know, not wearing clothes that were too highly colored, all that kind of cautious Protestant stuff, but nothing essentially religious. And essentially religious would be what? How, what do you mean when you use that phrase? Well, I think when you come across something that is the law McCoy, it just has a different taste from ordinary everyday stuff. Well, it was there in the Gospels for you, so we have... We, a sort of an inkling. Yes. It's somewhere or an other inkling. in those words. That's exactly right. And then I went through the confirmation thing, you know, when you were sort of given various propositions and that what you knew you had to do was go off and have three long nights of the soul and then come back Friday and say, yes, I assent to this. And then somebody, Bishop of Bath and Wells, came to Clifton College Chapel and put his hand on my head and I walked around in a, a sort of golden glow for about two weeks waiting for something to happen. And ever so slowly the sort of glow went off the boil. And that was it, as far as I was concerned, until the late 70s. And there's not the slightest bit of interest. Also, I was doing science at school. And uh, since we weren't taught any philosophy of science, I thought, thought that science would explain everything, whereas in my opinion, it explains almost nothing. But at that stage... It's useful for technology, and that's about it. But at that stage, you probably thought, or did you think, that it disproved this religion? Yes, because... that's right. Because the kind of religion that was on offer to me was this... Um, kind of nonsense. I mean, it, it, one of the things that gave me most happiness in life was when in the uh, Meaning of Life, the Monty Python film, Graham Chapman and I were able to, to write a parody of the kind of, of religion that I got between the age, I suppose, of seven and eighteen. And the lesson, which was always incomprehensible that we wrote, was the headmaster who says, And spotteth twice they the camels before the third hour, and so the Midianites went forth to Ram Gilead and Kadesh Bilgamath by Shor Ethra Regalium, to the house of Gash Beth Bethuel Bazda, he who brought the butter dish to Balshazar and the tent peg to the house of Rashomon, and there slew they the goats, yea, and place they the bits in little pots, here endeth the lesson. You know, and that was religion for us. You just sat there. You did, I mean, it is, as, as somebody once said, you either slept, talked, or invaded the pulpit. But you didn't sit there sort of thinking, how interesting, and I could learn something from this. Then, of course, you follow with the chaplain and say, let us praise God, O Lord, congregation, O Lord. Chaplain, oh, you are so big. Congregation, oh, you are so big. So absolutely huge congregation, so absolutely huge chaplain. Gosh, well, we're really all impressed down here, I can tell. The congregation repeats that. The chaplain says, forgive us, O oh Lord, for this our dreadful toadying. Congregation and barefaced flattery, chaplain, but you are so strong and well, just so simple. Congregation, fantastic. <laughs> and then they sing a hymn saying, O oh Lord, please don't burn us, don't grill or toast your flock. Don't put us on the barbecue or simmer us in stock. Don't braise or bake or boil us or stir fry us in a wok. You want me that well. And please don't lightly perch us or baste us with hot fat. Don't fricassee or roast us or boil us in a bat. And please don't stick thy servants, Lord, in a rotisserie. And that was as far as I, as I say, that was religion. You know, sort of, the great headmaster in the sky, the bathe the school rules will get to heaven. And it, it's hard not to avoid uh, the thought that uh, the John Cleese who later made that film and The Life of Brian was getting his own back at that kind of feature. Yes, that's right. And going and getting my... I mean, the great joy of watching Alan Bennett's sermon in Beyond the Fringe in 1962 and the hysterical laughter that that brought out was that you had seen sermons only slightly, only slightly less half-witted than that sermon. And, of course, it, it was a, a sense of enormous liberation because nobody made fun of anything like that in, uh, until 62. So when you reached the 70s, which you've said was the, the time that you started to 
want to re-examine the religious impulse. Why was that, and what triggered well, it? Well, the irony was that it was doing a background reading to, to write The Life of Brian. And I read Michael Grant's book on Jesus Christ, and for some reason, God knows why these things suddenly get to intrigue you, I w began to wonder what the kingdom of God really meant. And I started to read uh, other books, and round about that time I'd left Robin Skinner's group, it was about 78, and I'd got to know him socially. And he began to give me some stuff to read that I found very intriguing, and I happened to pick up one or two books on Buddhism and one or two books on Taoism. And uh, just got interested, but in a very chaotic and, and, and shapeless way. And then I came across a book that helped me enormously to understand what was going on. And it was a, a book by Aldous Huxley. It's actually a series of lectures. And um, he explains this, I think, absolutely beautifully. He says, basically, that there are two main kinds of religion. There is the religion of immediate experience. The religion, in the words of Genesis, of hearing the voice of God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The religion of direct acquaintance with the divine in the world. And then he says there's the religion of symbols, the religion of the imposition of order and meaning upon the world through verbal symbols and their manipulation or not them. The religion of knowledge about the divine rather than direct acquaintance with it, or the religion, as he says, of creed and theology. And he goes on that they've actually, these two types have always coexisted in the West, but the mystics have formed a minority always in the midst of the official symbol-manipulating religions, as he calls the sort of orthodox version. I mean orthodox in our sense, not Greek, Russian orthodox. And um, he goes on about a teacher called uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, who actually insisted upon the fact that in order to become directly acquainted with God, rather than merely to know about God, one must go beyond symbols and concepts. So that kind of explains to me that there's two different approaches, and what the Western approach is, has really always been, with the exception of a few mystics who are slightly embarrassing, sort of swept in the corner, is that we must try and understand this all with our minds, and basically argue about how many angels you can get in the head of a penny. And I think that can become pretty sterile. So the thing was that you recognized in that symbol dogma based side of religion what you had known or, and, and, and what had actually been lacking for you, that what hadn't given you anything. And so we were drawn to the other, the, the experience. Yes, I was drawn to the experience. At that point. That's right. And I started to meditate um, and found that there was no question. I mean, this stage was nothing spiritual. It was just that I felt much calmer and clearer after I'd meditated. If I meditated in the, in the morning, I became quite an efficient human being for at least an hour and a half until you sort of get stirred up by everything that's going on. Then you go back into that more stirred up state, slightly manic state that most of us, I think, live most of our, our working days in. Who taught you how to meditate? Do you know I don't know any one person, did I think I got it out of books? Robin Skinner taught me at one stage, a Buddhist friend taught me at one stage, a friend of mine in San Francisco taught me. I think the trouble about meditation is that people think that there's a, a very particular way of doing it. You know that you have to learn a technique, a mantra, or seven times table backwards or so. I mean, the most beautiful description I've ever, ever come across, which I think is just alive, makes me feel better to read it, which I do frequently, is by a lovely Buddhist teacher whom I, uh, I met uh, by chance. I went to see the Dalai Lama, and this guy came up afterwards, and uh, he said, he, he told me he, that he was a big fan. And uh, later on, I discovered that he was the first incarnate Lama who'd ever said that to me. <laughs> he, uh, he's a wonderful man. It's called Sogyo Rinpoche. He says, a good meditator, he says, first of all, knows how to take meditation humorously. Because if you don't know how to do that, then it could end up being more of a problem than a help. Well, what a great start that is. And then he says, in the beginning when you meditate, thoughts start running right, even wilder than before. Yet this is a good sign, for finally you have become aware of how wild the state of your mind normally is. It's not that your thoughts have become wilder, but as you become quieter, now you're aware just how wild your thoughts, in fact, nearly always are. It's then that you need to have humor, serious humor. He says, don't give up. Whatever arises, just keep being present, watching the breath, 
you know, just being aware of the breath coming in. Out. Even amidst all the confusion, something will settle after a while and slowly a feeling of peace will draw. He goes on, in meditation we're reminded to be mindful and aware. And this means that whatever arises, you allow it to flow naturally, like an old wise man watching a child at play. It's so hard for us to do that in the West, not to edit our thoughts, you know. And he says, if you're thinking, you just let that thought rise and settle without any constraint. Thoughts are like the wind, they come and go. If you don't think of them, they do not pose much of a problem. Somebody once said to me, it's like watching the windscreen wipers go on your car. You know that they're going, but you don't actually have to watch them. You look beyond them. And then he says, we tend to think when you're meditating, there should be no thoughts. And when thoughts arise in our meditation, we assume that we're failing to do it properly. Actually, he says, this is not the case. You realize that when you're meditating, thoughts are very much part of it. Instead, he says, it's all a question of what your attitude towards them is. When you reach the state of meditation, the thoughts no longer bother you. They become like soft, pleasant background music. In other words, sometimes when I meditate, I'm able not to follow my thoughts, because if you follow them, you get lost in them. And if you just let them go, just note them, and somehow stay with some awareness of the sensation in your body, then you, you, you just, it all, it all settles. And then he says a lovely thing. He says, to begin with, you center yourself and you get in touch with your soft spot. And sometimes, I've heard him talk, he talks about your cozy spot, that part in you, he says, you just feel cozy. And then he says, if you remain there, gradually meditation will blossom, blossom. Just be spacious and allow all your thoughts and emotions to settle. And uh, he obviously uh, goes on and uh, describes more, but he says, out of this quietness slowly arises your real being. You experience an aspect of yourself which is more genuine and more authentic, the real you. And then he says, as you go deeper, you begin to discover and connect with your fundamental goodness. Because, of course, the big difference between the East and the West is that in the West we're told that we're fundamentally rather sinful. And in the East they believe that you're fundamentally good. But how, how did you manage, I mean, learning, teaching yourself to meditate, starting to read masters like this, at a time when, of course, you were deeply involved with the public career we all know, how did you square that? How were you able to be in touch with this soft I'm self? Not, in a, in a world, no. You're still trying. Yes, <laughs> desperately. It's why I'm sort of kind of looking forward at the moment to doing two more, three more movies and then stopping because I find it extraordinarily difficult to do any of this stuff um, when it's been like the last two weeks when I've been dashing around all over the place, you know, going to my mother's 94th birthday in Western Supermare, shooting two days for video arts, going to Chicago to see my nine-year-old coming back via New York and having, you know what I mean? And, and, and fighting for, for, for quiet and space and I, I'm not good at fighting for it. it and all the time gets filled up, and then I begin to feel my, my life has a, has a less good quality. There's no question. But I, somehow, as I say, it's so counter to the culture of our time. Your approach to matters of faith, interestingly, seems to come through the teaching, through the words of others. Is, is that because you don't actually trust yourself, that you, you cannot sit back and let it wash over you, as it were. How do you mean wash over me? Well, there would be those who would say, um, with T.S. Eliot, for instance, when T.S. Eliot uh, found faith after many years of searching, he, he wrote a line of poetry which said, therefore I rejoice, having to construct something upon which to rejoice. Seems to me that that's what you're doing. But there would be those who would say, John, maybe you're thinking too much, maybe you're reading too much, maybe on a mountain. Oh, yeah, you could, absolutely. You could experience it. No, this is what's funny. I mean, the, the Buddhists always say, well, the last thing before you achieve enlightenment is you've got to kick out Buddhism. In other words, they say, don't mistake the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. And uh, that's all about that stuff about if you find Buddha on the road, kill him. It's, uh, that's what that's all about. And you get it if you read Meister Eckhart, who's a great uh, Christian mystic. He's always saying, whatever you say about God isn't going to be right. But somehow, you've got to get there somehow. So you've got to start with a few ideas, even if you're going to kick them out at the end. But it's a hard, it's a hard process to... Yes, but of course, when you're in the mood, you know, when you're in the mood, it's of course the only interesting thing in the world. And then you spend a bit of time on it. And then you find West Hammer on the television playing a European Cup game and you forget it all. <laughs>
Best hammer on the television playing a European Cup game and you forget it all. <laughs> Do you believe in the idea of soul? Well, I don't know is the answer. Um, what I suspect is that there's something within us that is alive, but that we have to work at keeping it alive, particularly in the 20th century. And there's a lovely piece in a, in a book called The New Man, written by a man called Morris Nichol. He's talking about a phrase that Christ says, let the dead bury their dead. Matthew 8, 22. He says, obviously he's not referring to people who are literally dead. How can literally dead people bury literally dead people? Men are divided into the dead and the living with a special significance. The phrase, the quick and the dead, refers to people who have something alive in themselves and to those who have not and so are dead already. And then he goes on, a man immersed in life who can see nothing save the interests of the world, the power of money, of position and rivalry, is dead. And I've met people, um, I thought of two people then, one was a politician I met, one was a, a man in charge of a PR company, who seemed to me to be dead inside. Spiritually dead? Yes, even more than spiritually. They were walking around, talking, <laughs> being perfectly nice. The PR guy was being absolutely charming. There was something absolutely dead. And um, I think that's the great danger in our society, with all this dashing around. And this is what you're trying to counteract in yourself? Yes, that's right. I've got a piece here written by Sogya Rinpoche again, which catches. I mean, he, he's lovely. He talks about laziness. And he says there's two types of laziness. There's the Eastern and Western laziness. He says the Eastern style is like the one practiced to perfection in India. It consists of hanging out all day on the sun, doing nothing, avoiding any kind of work, useful activity, drinking cups of tea, listening to Hindi film music, blaring on the radio, gossiping with friends. When I read that to a group of people the other day, many of whom were Indian, they hardly laugh. He says, Western laziness is quite different. It consists of cramming our lives with compulsive activity so that there is no time at all to confront the real issues. If we look into our lives, we will see clearly how many unimportant tasks, so-called responsibilities, accumulate to fill them up. One master compares them to housekeeping in a dream. We tell ourselves we want to spend time on the important things in life, but there never is any time. Even simply to get up in the morning, so much to do. You have to open the window, make the bed, take a shower, brush your teeth, feed the dog or cat, do last night's washing up, discover you're out of sugar or coffee, go out, buy them, make breakfast. The list is endless. Our lives seem to live us. Wonderful phrase. That's how I feel about it. To possess their own bizarre momentum. Carry us away. And in the end, we feel that we have no choice or control. Of course, we sometimes feel bad about this. We have nightmares. We wake up in a sweat wondering, what am I doing with my life? But our fears only last until breakfast time. And out comes the briefcase and back we go where we started. And that, I think, is a very good description. He says, modern society seems to me a celebration of all the things that lead us away from truth, make truth hard to live for, and discourage people from even believing that it exists. And to think that all this springs from a civilization that claims to adore life, but actually starves it of any real meaning. It endlessly speaks of making people happy, but in fact blocks their way to the source of real joy. Pretty powerful, hard to argue with. Can't say sorry, Sagio Rinpoche. Few mistakes in there. And it, it speaks to you about it your It certainly life. speaks to me. It, it speaks to me very much. There's one other thing he says, in connection with death, but I think it's very relevant to what we're just talking about. He said the deepest reason perhaps why we're afraid of death is because we do not know who we are. We believe in a personal, unique and separate identity, but if we dare to examine it, we find that this identity depends entirely on an English collection of things to pop it up. Our name, our biography, our CV, our partners, family, job, home, friends, credit cards. It's on their fragile and transient support that we rely for our security. He says, when they're all taken away, will we have any idea of who we really are? Without our familiar props, we're faced with just ourselves, a person we do not really know. An unnerving stranger with whom we've been living all the time, but whom we never really wanted to meet. Isn't that why we have to try and fill up every moment of time with noise and activity to ensure that we're never left in silence with this stranger on our own? The stranger being the self? 
one's own soul. Who you really are, your soul. What's inside there when all the class prejudices and all that racialist thoughts and, you know, ambitions and thoughts of bank balance are out of the way. Now that book is the Tibetan book of living and dying. Mm. And what it's actually about is dying. Yeah. All the emphasis is about learning to die well. Learning to die at peace with yourself, knowing yourself, as you say people do. Is that something you think about? I mean, do you think about your own death and achieving that? Yes. I read a long time ago, um, Carl Jung, who says that the second half of life should be a preparation for death. And um, that seems absolutely right to me. I think the first half of life, people shouldn't be bothering about that. They should be getting on, finding out who they are and doing lots of things and having lots of fun. But at the end of it all, there is what Robert Skinner calls the long drop onto the concrete. <laughs> And if you try and sort of forget that, or sort of think, well, maybe it won't happen to me, or, um, you know, just shove it out of consciousness, I think you're really losing the whole point of our existence. And I, I, the reason I particularly read that bit is that I think it's only by really beginning to think about the fact that our lives have a limited span that we're ever brought back to what is really valuable. And I think that's why people very frequently don't begin to take too much interest in the sort of stuff we've been talking about. So they get... I believe, and this may sound absurdly over-precise, to about 34. And I've noticed a lot of people, 33 and a half, 34, that's when they start thinking about this stuff and beginning to question some of the assumptions of their life because 34 is almost halfway to the biblical three score and ten. And that's the moment, I think, when people are scrambling up a ladder and doing awfully well and being paid well and, you know, married and a couple of kids, and suddenly they think, well, do I want to be on this ladder? Are there other ladders? Should I go up a bit more on this and then switch ladders? What else do I want to do? You're, you're a bit past the 34 mark. <laughs> oh, well, you know it. So, so is it, <laughs> but does it come in stronger? Yes. Because actually I recently turned 54, and that probably means that I've got 23-ish more summer holidays, and I start thinking about it that way. Is that a frightening thought? I think it's sobering. Like all these things, it's double-edged, and when you realize you have less time, at least you don't waste it as much as you do. I mean, people when they're young, you waste time because they don't have any sense that it's limited. The more limited it becomes, the more you refuse to do things you don't want to do. What do you think of the actual end? Do you think of what happens and where you go? Uh, I've read a bit of this Tibetan book of the dead. The Dalai Lama said it. He said that in his own meditation, each day, he contemplates his own death. I forget how many times he said, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen times. And he said, when you do that throughout your training as a man, when you start dying, you start thinking, now this is all most interesting. Um, is it all going to happen as described in the books? You know, so people get fascinated in the process because, of course, they believe that, uh, that they are going to be reincarnated. And that's fascinating. I mean, the question of whether, we haven't talked about it after life at all. Isn't it strange? But whether or not there's something that goes on afterwards, well, I suppose if you, if you assume there's some sort of spiritual force, you tend to think there's something that's going on afterwards. But I, I doubt if I can figure out what it can be, because most of us are so dreadfully sort of vain and sensitive and, and, and egotistical. Surely that stuff doesn't go out in, <laughs> into the universe if something leaves our bodies. I can't imagine the sort of spirit figures going around saying, I'm still better looking than him, or, you know, gosh, she's put on weight. I mean, what is it of us that actually goes out there? Which bit of you would you like to go on? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. I suppose the bit that's interesting. Yes, the bit that's interesting.